Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for watching this presentation. Uh, I was sorry that I couldn't meet anybody in person or, I guess, virtually, but that's okay. Um, there's my email address if you want to reach out to me if you have any questions. And I can I can actually we'll send the PDF of this presentation with all the applicable links in them for you to, to look at on your own as well. So my name is Laura Myers. I'm a retired teacher from the Hampton area, Hampton, New Brunswick. I taught uh, math for 34 years and environmental science in the last few years, uh, mainly grade nine, but I did some 10 to 12 as well, also in French, many of my courses. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement from where I come from. I'm in New Brunswick and uh, we were on the unsurrendered territory of the Willistiqui, the Mi'kmaq and the Passamaquoddy peoples. And we definitely at LSF work a lot with uh, we like to incorporate Indigenous ways of knowing in our teaching because we know how important it is uh, that we incorporate those teachings because it's the Indigenous people of the lands who have been stewarding our lands for since time immemorial. So a little bit about me. Um, I told you that I mainly taught math my whole career, uh, but about seven years ago, our whole school saw this documentary called Before the Flood. And it's a documentary made by Leonardo DiCaprio. He was hired by National Geographic to travel around the world and see firsthand the effects of climate change. And it was an incredible documentary. And I went back to my class. I know what we were supposed to be teaching quadratics. And I looked at them and I wrote on the board, now what? And the students had all kinds of ideas. We should you know, build a greenhouse. We should do this. We should do that. So I wrote down some of their ideas. And really, as soon as I learned about this, I guess my head was kind of in the sand about it before. I realized I have to incorporate this in my teaching. So I did a few things. I took my carbon footprint and discovered that if everyone lived like me, it would take over four planets to sustain the resources that I use. Uh, it was right around the time when Greta Thunberg's first uh, TED Talk came out and I watched that and was even more inspired. And then I decided that I wanted to be trained by the Climate Reality Project because I wanted to learn more about climate change. And so I became a climate reality leader and now there's some pictures taken from my school uh, just a couple of years ago uh, on the left. It's in the snow, but that is the greenhouse. We did build it um, and we start our plants inside in February, take them outside in the greenhouse and then move them over to our garden. And there's also a food forest there. And these are just a couple of the initiatives that have happened at our school since kind of awakening and understanding just how big climate change, big a problem climate change is. And when I retired, I was uh, I have been working with LSF as a teacher learning for a sustainable future for a few years where I took a climate change course for them and used some of the resources. And I got called and they asked me if I would like to work for them, which is amazing. So I'm not sure if you know much about learning for a sustainable future, but our mission is to promote through education the knowledge, skills, perspectives and practices essential to a sustainable future. We're a nonprofit, uh, we're national, we're bilingual. And uh, we provide services to teachers for free in most cases. Sometimes the district pays for them. Um, and it's just an amazing organization. I'm so proud to be part of it. So the plan for this webinar uh, is to introduce an overview and give you an overview of the sustainable development goals, why they are important for educators and students, give you examples of how math teachers can incorporate them in their teaching. I'm going to be sharing resources that can help you along the way. And um, if you were here together, I would have given you time to plan and share, plan things you're going to do. But I am going to give you a Google Doc that I'd like you to put your ideas in. And I'd love to see that build up over time. So you'll definitely, when the, this time is over, have time to think about what you would like to do. How would you like to incorporate the sustainable development goals in your curriculum? I guess I just have that slide twice, maybe even three times. It doesn't want to move. So let's start by thinking uh, about what are the things that you think about that are going on in the world right now? What, what are you concerned about? What do you care about? And I'll give you a minute just to think about, you know, see if there's one thing that pops into your mind, something you really care about right now. Probably everybody has thought of at least one thing. <laughs> it's kind of weird doing this presentation with nobody in front of me, but that's okay. Um, maybe these are the sustainable development goals. And I guarantee that whatever it is you thought of that concerns you fits into this somewhere. So to just provide a little bit of history, in 2015, all of the countries of the United Nations gathered together and made up these 17 sustainable development goals. And the goal is to achieve them by 2030. 
So as you can see, <laughs> it will be very difficult to achieve all of these goals by 2030, and it's going to need all hands on deck, especially education. And I'm going to be honest with you right now. This is like a disclaimer. Many of the examples that I'm going to give you are related to number 13, which is climate action, which is something that I am personally very passionate about. But these are all interconnected. So I want you to think about where does your issue of concern fit into the sustainable development goal chart? If you're if you said that you your passion is your children, of course, health and well-being would be there, quality education. Um, if your concern is about um, electrifying our energy system, then you're talking about, um, you know, renewables and uh, sustainable cities and renew uh, number seven. And, and these things are also related to climate action because climate action, the goal is to prevent, to mitigate climate change. And if climate change is not prevented, then it affects all of these other things. And I'm going to just start with maybe I found these uh, top eight social justice issues um, from, this is actually taken from the World Economic Forum, so I'm going to be honest, probably these would be different if I had chosen like entertainment tonight, but um, these are the top eight stories from 2022. All of these are related somehow to the sustainable development goals. Number nine, I think, was the Queen's um, the death of Queen Elizabeth II, which I would have probably fit on there as well, but I just tip, picked these top top eight. So these things are happening in the world. These issues are all related to SDGs in one way or another. And as I said, many of them are related to climate change. So if these are the issues that our students are hearing about and talking about, shouldn't we be talking about them in our classes? I'm going to just show you a few results from a recent survey that was given by Learning for a Sustainable Future. It was a climate education survey but it's definitely related to the SDGs. So in this survey, 60% of Canadians agreed that climate change education should be the role of all teachers across all subjects and all grades. And, but <laughs> climate change isn't being taught. So over a third of educators don't report covering climate change in their classes at all. And when it is, it's mostly science class. And I'm ashamed to see <laughs> that math is not up there. Math is, didn't even make the list. I mean, maybe it was one or 2%, but it didn't make this list. So why, why is that? Well, teachers are feeling unprepared and stressed for time. And I understand that that's probably the reason why there's nobody on this call today. Um, but it's so important that we do that because what we teach shows our students what's important to us. A couple more uh, slides from the survey because I just think it's really interested, interesting. So only 13% taught 11 or more hours of climate content within the school year. And interestingly, it says that 31% spent less than five hours. But if you look at the, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought there were, it was not covered in there. Yes. So not covered at all is actually 35%. So really that 35% should be added to the 31%. And uh, so it actually should be 66% of teachers um, spent less than five hours teaching it because people that, I guess that shows us right there that data, uh, interpreting data is important because <laughs> even that interpretation really is incorrect. And also many Canadians feel that climate change education should include social justice issues such as um, social economic and political aspects, racial inequality, gender inequality, and social justice issue, and Indigenous knowledge. And I'm actually surprised that those numbers are that low. I would assume that it would be even higher, because when you're talking about climate change education, it's going to touch on these things as well. Now, I know that teachers are being asked to do a lot, and I'm not trying to add anything else to your plate at all. I'm just trying to make you see, if you don't already see, how important our role is as educators when we are talking to students. But the SDGs actually provide a context for addressing all the things we're already being asked to teach. Uh, it's a context for the curriculum, which we have to teach. We're asked to teach 21st century global competencies. We're asked to teach about social justice, environment education, outdoor learning, and mental health. And so if, you, if we're focusing on the SDGs, it's actually incorporating all these things that we're already being asked to do. Now, I like this, this quote, hope is a verb with its shirt sleeves rolled up. So let's talk about what you can do as a math teacher, a high school math teacher, to incorporate the SDGs in your classroom. Well, I think the best thing to do when we're talking about this is to start with the curriculum. So 
let's start with grade nine curriculum. So one of the things that grade nines do is they represent data graphically. Um, I've been looking a little bit into the Quebec curriculum. It's fairly similar to New Brunswick. Um, so one thing for grade, I think we do this in grade 10, actually, in New Brunswick. Um, this is, I know this slide's in French, but most of you probably do speak a little bit of French, but I'll, I'll, I'll translate for you. So the question was, do the number of motorized boats registered have an effect on the number of Le Montaigne to eight, which I've forgotten the word for Le Montaigne right now in that picture. <laughs> so this is a, a table that shows the number of motorized boats that were registered in per year and the number of, of these uh, La Montaigne, which were killed. So one thing I would do with my students is I would show them this table of values and say, well, do, does do you think that the number of boats actually has an effect? And looking at the table, it's really hard to tell. But then when you put this in a graph, um, you can see that there definitely is a trend. So I think it's, you know, when you're using examples of data, you could just choose examples that are related to the environment or related to another STD, SD, SDG. I just said STD, <laughs> sorry about that. So data management is a good place to start. Um, in grade 10, students work a lot with formulas and teaching them how to rearrange formulas. So this is an example that was taken from an introduction to environmental issues in course at Mo Memorial University, but I think it's interesting. So um, direct global warming potentials of selected gases. So basically carbon dioxide, um, uh, the potential over 20 years, 100 years, and five, 500 years. So these other gases are compared to carbon dioxide. So you can see that methane um, is 62 times more potent after 20 years, 23 times more potent after 100 years, and seven times more potent than carbon dioxide after 500 years. So just talking about the different types of gases that are made of greenhouse gases. And you could give an example like this. So a manufacturing process produces this these pollutants. Um, estimate the global warming potential over a 20 year time period. So you take those three gases that were in the list and you would put them in a formula, and this is the formula you could use, mass times global warming potential equals, so you've got the 1.89 kilograms of methane times the 62 kilograms of CO2, and then you have how much carbon dioxide equivalent. So that could be used in physics as well. So formulas are out there that compare different greenhouse gases. Um, in grade 11, um, we talk about exponential growth. Um, so this is a video from David Suzuki that talks about exponential growth, and I'm going to play it. I know it might be a little bit uh, lagged for you because you're watching a recording with a video embedded in it, but I'd like to play it because I think it's important that um, you see this video. I'm going to stop sharing for a second, though, and I'm going to make sure that when I'm sharing that I'm sharing the sound as well, which I just noticed that I hadn't done that. So. So this is an amazing video to teach students about exponential growth. I'm going to play that right now. It's short. You know, there are a lot of things that we can fix in this world. We can do something about. We can design the cities that we live in, the kinds of houses we live in, the market, the economy, currency, how many trees we're going to cut, how many fish we're going to catch. Those things human beings can manage and control because we create them and do them. But some things are facts of life. We have to live with the speed of light, gravity, uh, entropy, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Those are things that we have to accept and work ourselves around. And there is another one that is absolutely crucial. It's a mathematical reality called exponential growth. If something is growing at 1% a year, it'll double in 70 years. 2% a year, it'll double in 35 years. 3% a year in 24 years. 4%, 17 and a half years. Anything growing exponentially will double in a predictable length of time. Now I'm going to show you why all of this stuff about we got to keep growing, keep the economy growing, we've got to keep everything growing is ultimately suicidal. I'm going to give you a system analogous to the planet, and that's a test tube full of food for bacteria. So the test tube and food is the planet and the bacteria are us. Now I'm going to introduce one bacterial cell in and it's going to divide every minute. That's exponential growth. So at time zero at the beginning, there's one cell. One minute, there are two. Two minutes, there are four. Three minutes, there are eight. Four minutes, 16. That's 
exponential growth. And at 60 minutes, the test tube is completely packed with bacteria and there's no food left. So we have a 60 minute growth cycle. When is the test tube only half full? Well, of course, the answer is at 59 minutes. Even though it's been chugging along for 59 minutes, it's only half full, but one minute later, it'll be completely filled. So that means at 58 minutes, it's 25% full. 57 minutes, it's 12.5% full. At 55 minutes of a 60-minute cycle, it's 3% full. At uh, 55 minutes, one of the bacteria says, hey, guys, I've been thinking, we got a problem. We got a population problem. The other bacteria would say, Jack, what the hell have you been smoking, man? 97% of the test tube's empty, and we've been around for 55 minutes. And they'd be five minutes away from filling it. So, say bacteria are no smarter than humans. At 59 minutes, they go, oh my God, Jack was right. We got one minute left. What are we going to do? Well, don't give any money to those economists that are saying we got to keep growing all the time. Uh, give it to those scientists. So they massively inject money into the scientific community. And guess what? In less than a minute, those bacterial scientists invent three new test tubes full of food. That'd be like us finding three more planets that we could use. What happens? In 60 minutes, the first test tube's full. 61 minutes, the second's full. 62 minutes, all four are full. By quadrupling the amount of food in space, we buy two extra minutes. Our home is the biosphere. It's fixed and finite. It can't grow. And we've got to learn to live within that finite world. Every scientist I've talked to agrees with me. We've already passed the 59th minute. Wow. <laughs> I think that's just an amazing... So I assume you know that there's a lot of people on this now. planet. As of last... I think that's an amazing an example of uh, exponential growth, of course, and also just an example of how important it is that we take care of our planet. And it has so much math in it. <laughs> what about some other things? What about projects in math class? I know people say, what? I'm not going to do a project in math class. Well, I think projects are super interesting. I just realized I forgot to turn my camera back on. Um, you can do projects on, here's some projects examples that I've done before. So linear relations. Collect data that you believe will be linear, graph the data, make a prediction, bonus points if your data has a positive environmental impact or an STG impact. Exponential functions, research something that grows exponentially like a virus or depreciates exponentially like a new vehicle, create a table of values, talk about, you know, depreciation of new vehicles and, and you know, the fact that we overconsume. Uh, eco schools, your, your class could choose a project from the eco schools list and present it to the, to the class and just make sure that that includes math. And waste audits are interesting. You know, if you're doing data collection, you can collect waste and make a graph showing what you found. Um, and here's some more project ideas. Uh, financial literacy, like credit card debt, same day loans, discuss poverty, <clears throat> investigate GDP in different countries, uh, math and happiness. How does the happiness quotient? get calculated. Uh, data collection, I mentioned before, create a survey, graph the results, and ask a question related to the STGs. And you can always go outside with your math class. Uh, here's some things that I've done. So in quadratics, we went outside, found something that's shaped as a parabola, sketch the shape, and find the equation. I've had them throw balls up in the air and then model that using a quadratic. In circle geometry, like an introduction, you could have people around a circle. How many people does it take to make a circle? Calculate the area of a circular garden or the diameter of a tree. Pythagorean theorem, you've probably done this before, using shadows and indirect measurements to estimate the height of a flagpole or the height of a tree. So these are things that you can go outside. Going outside, we can do it in any class. And it teaches students how like, they will protect what they love. I'm going to show you an example. So I use my daughter's example here. They had to create a situation that could be modeled by a quadratic function. So what she did is she used a catapult. So I'll just play this video very quickly. Oh no, I gave myself, this is my access. It won't let it happen. Darn it. Um, basically what you'll see, if I could play this, I don't know why it's not working, is that she used a catapult and she flew uh, a ball across the, the yard and as uh, she calculated the distance it went and then made a, a function out of it. It's pretty cool. Um, interpreting data, as I said, can be used in many math classes. Like uh, for example, this is a graph showing um, uh, annual global 
ocean average temperatures. And people would look at this and say, oh, well, there's not a problem. But then you take the same data and put it in a graph like this. Well, there's definitely a big problem. And so just talking to students about interpreting data or creating graphs and the importance of scale. And here's another graph, like what story does this graph tell? And this is an inverter uh, on the 31st of March. Um, this is a, uh, an inverter from our high school um, solar panels, actually. So it's kind of neat to, you could use, if you're talking about how graphs tell stories, choose a graph that, that's telling a story about the environment or about, a, a so, about social justice. And you could always start the class with something you saw in the news. I know we all start classes often with talking about things that, you know, have happened on the weekend or things you read about or learned about. And this, this is one that was uh, done by the, the guy that started 350.org. The simple math problem could be the key to solving our climate crisis. And this is a, a clickable link when you get the PDF. You can go and check that out. It's actually pretty interesting. It doesn't You don't have to go far to find... Uh, SDGs in the news. Now, there are lots of resources out there from LSF and other places to support you. And um, as I said, these links will be clickable when you get the PDF. There are webinars that are offered like this one, professional development, uh, pre-recorded PE sessions that you could, even some that you could just show to your students. Um, that are for students. But one thing I want to show you is resources for rethinking. This is probably my favorite resource that we offer. And I'm just going to show you, um, take a minute to walk you through how this resource works, because uh, just so you understand. So we start by choosing a province. So today we'll choose Quebec. And then you choose a grade. Now, I'm going to admit, as you get higher up in grades, the choices are more limited, but uh, let's pick grade nine. And so I'm going to, I'm going to pick math. And then under the curriculum links, you'll see that there are some choices here. So we can choose arithmetic and let's let's choose arithmetic and algebra. Now, somebody at LSF has actually gone in and behind the scenes, researched the curriculum from each province and found resources that are related to the curriculum. And then these resources are vetted by teachers. Teachers read through them, they try them with their class, and then they let LSF know if they think that it should be something that we would include. And you can actually choose by sustainable development goals. So I'm gonna choose climate action just because I want to, but you could choose something else. And under resource type, I'm gonna choose lesson plan. So, and I'm gonna to go to an advanced search. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't check this out in advance. I should have done that because now there's nothing showing up. <laughs> That's my fault. Okay, let's go back and choose. Uh, I already, I did this before, but it's funny that the same things weren't coming up. So under math, I'm gonna choose a um, theme. I'm gonna choose, sorry about this. I already did this once before. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm just gonna do a new search. Yeah, let's just do a brand new search here. Uh, so let me do a new search. Okay, so here we go. So here are some, yeah, okay, now it's letting it happen. Sometimes you have to load it twice. So, um, Girls for the Planet. Let's just say and choose this one. So in this lesson, students investigate the environmental benefits that arise from empowering women and girls. So you click on here and it'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, and then you can just click on get this resource. And when you get the resource, this one is um, from Australia. It has the explanations of how it works. Um, I just wanna go back and show a different one because there was one there that I have actually used before. Um, oh, this is cool, by use and cost. And if you click on a full curriculum match, um, it will tell you more about how it's related to the curriculum. So a closer look at the things we buy. And again, you just click on get this resource and it takes you directly to this resource. And it's all resources that you can trust because they have been um, vetted by teachers. So I would, if I were with you in person, I would want everyone to take about 10 minutes to like, go through this and find things that are related to what you're going to be teaching in the next week, because that's a question I'm going to ask you near the end. So resources for rethinking on the LSF website is amazing. So hope doesn't come from words, it only comes from actions. That's grown up one of my favorite quotes from Geta. So now it's your turn. So um, 
I hope that these examples have inspired you to think about what is it you're going to be teaching in the next week or the next month that you could integrate a sustainable development goal into your lesson. Um, and I would love it if you would share with the rest of the teachers that are going to be listening to this call. So um, I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the Google Sheet, the way it looks. So this Google Sheet has a place for you to put your name, your email, the grade level that you're teaching, um, the unit you're working on, and then what you're planning on doing, and then any resources that you want to add to this. So this Google Sheet, the link will be in the PDF that you get. And I really would love to see this Google Sheet fill up with people's ideas. And, you know, people that are teaching grade 11, something they're teaching grade 11, they can go and see what other people have done. And I can, I can order it by grade. And so I'm really, really hoping that you'll put something in there that you're going to do. Or it could be something that you already did. Um, but I'd love to see this fill out because I know there are lots of teachers from the, the teachers that I talk to say that they have a lot of things they want to do. They just don't know what to do and they don't have time to think about it. So I really want you to think about at least one thing that you might do. I gave a presentation last week in New Brunswick and, and teachers chose one thing that they would do in the next week. And I'll be following up with them to see, did you do that thing? So we really don't have time for questions or comments, but we have time, but it's not going to work in this setting. Um, my email address is lmyers at lsf lst.ca. I really would love it if you reached out to me with any questions you had. I'll be checking that Google Doc once in a while to see um, what it is that people are up to. And you certainly can email me with any ideas. And if you have a, if you come across a resource that you think would be great to put in a resource for rethinking, please let me know. I'll send it to Debbie and she'll have a, a teacher look at it. So I'm going to stop sharing right now so you can see my face again. Maybe you can see it the whole time. And I, I really appreciate you listening to this recording. And I hope that it's given you inspiration to use in your teaching. Um, because really, our planet depends on us and our students are depending on us. And I think we have a very important role to play. So thanks again and hope to hear from you soon. Bye-bye.